Hi everyone, it is now three o'clock Eastern time, one o'clock mountain. So we are ready to get this webinar underway. We are really excited to share this information with you. Um, you know, we started to build out this webinar and realized we had so much meat, so much content, so much uh, helpful tips to share with you guys that we ended up splitting up um, a massive webinar into three still very large webinars. <laughs> so we have a lot we wanna cover in this hour. So just so you know, if you guys miss anything at all, we will make sure that the recording and the slides are sent to anyone who registered for the webinar today. Um, and we do have a part two and a part three that will be happening in June and July. We'll share those dates with you as well later in the webinar. Um, that being said, we are excited to get started. Again, we've got our panel here and um, we are ready to get going. If you have any questions, you can drop them in the Q&A section below, or you can feel free to drop things in the chat as well and we'll try to respond to those. All right, take it away, Dr. A. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, great. Well, what we hope you learned today, and thanks again for spending your time with us today. Like what Sarah said, uh, we thought we could handle all this in one webinar, uh, but it would have been a four hour webinar. And so we have Dr. Willis and myself and Dr. Borg, we've come up with a lot of great things over the years. We've made a lot of mistakes and we're sharing with you what we've learned, the good and the ugly. But what we hope you learn today is understanding accounting terms like opportunity cost, EBITDA, net profit margin, negotiating terms like Banta, Zopa, and anchoring. It's all part of understanding and controlling your expenses. We hope you understand a new, a new opportunity cost uh, KPI or, or, or number you gotta report. It's, it's just as important as production and collections, if not more so. We're calling it the hourly overhead, hourly overhead rate we also want to make sure you understand why, how, how important it is that your staff knows this number too. It'll help all of you make better decisions. We're going to introduce to you our concepts of saving money and minding your margins and reducing your costs. We're calling it the big five. We're going to introduce big five lesson number one. Don't be afraid to negotiate everything. And then uh, finally, we have 12 dental practice items that you need to negotiate today. Who are we? I'm Dr. Anderson, James Anderson, CEO of eAssist, uh, practicing dentist. I'm actually in the dental office today. I do dentistry every other Friday. Usually it's for free for, na for friends and neighbors. <laughs> um, uh, but I've been a dentist for a long time. Uh, Co-chair of the Roseman Dental School MBA Advisory Board. You can read their uh, executive MBA equivalent to call OPM from Harvard Business School. Received a BS in finance from BYU and my DMD from OHSU, Taylor. Hi, uh, I'm Taylor Anderson. It's a pleasure to be on the panel again today. Uh, I'm a business lawyer. I've been practicing about 17 years. Uh, received a law degree and an MBA from Willamette University in Oregon. Um, was a, formerly a partner at a Salt Lake City firm. Uh, Co-founded my own firm a number of years ago uh, here in Utah. Joined the assist about a year ago. And James, I'm going to see you a little bit later for some dental work. Yeah, it's almost, <laughs> that's a HIPAA violation. Don't, don't talk about that. <laughs> that's that free dental work you're talking about. Oh, yeah, some more of it. Taylor, or uh, Brian. Yeah, I'm Dr. Borg. I've been practicing dentistry for 14 years, just like a lot of you. I started and owned three dental pro offices all from scratch. Um, one unique thing to me and the panel is that I still have my hair. And I, I noticed <laughs> you guys all got your haircut, your COVID haircut. I got mine. Boom. So, that's <laughs> I'll put it as a bullet. That's a bullet, boy. <laughs> All a right, bullet. Warren, move on. Warren, what do you got? Yeah, uh, I'm Warren Willis. I've built uh, 11 dental practices over the years. I still practice dentistry. Been practicing for about 18 years. I also graduated with James from Oregon Health Science University. Those were good times. You were top of the class. <laughs> I, 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 I've started nine dental practices. I forgot to say that. Uh, who do we represent? E-Assist Dental Solutions. We're America's number one dealing, de dental billing service provider. We have over 800 team members strong, and we serve thousands of dentists all over the country. And you can see all the awards that we've won. There's a lot more, too, that we don't we didn't post it. Our core purpose is to deliver peace of mind. That's why we're doing this. We want to help you as a dentist have peace of mind. We want to make sure you understand that we're dentists helping dentists trying to deliver peace of mind. Taylor, what's the rest of this stuff say about legal and tax advice? So, you know, of course, we're not giving legal or tax advice. Uh, you know, we're not covering... All details, laws and strategies change. Of course, you know, consult with your own professional advisors. That said, the three dentists on our panel uh, want to share with you some things they've learned after years and years of building and operating practices. Thanks, Taylor. Taylor, have you sued anyone today? I want to know. <laughs> like on the Facebook pages, on the lawyer Facebook group page. Just kidding. All right, we know. Can we work on him today, James. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you are we now more we now know more than ever every dollar counts we're here to help uh, let's get into the meat of what we're talking about now it's important to understand that most uh, non dentists that run businesses don't call their stuff overhead uh, all of their expenses whenever they spend money they call it expenses and, and and when we talk to each other as dentists we call it overhead uh, but but this is this is something we pull from dental economics every cost not associated with dentist income is considered overhead. Keep that in mind. As we go through these examples, we're going to talk about what is practice overhead. What is our practice overhead? And I, Warren, let's drop a little tiny snippet here. I think your your practice overhead is thirty nine or thirty eight or what is it? Yeah, thirty five in one uh, practice, thirty eight in another. Yeah. So when, when we say that, we're excluding any dental, any uh, we're excluding any cost to uh, to dentists. So if you have associates, we're not considering that part of the overhead. Uh, and so keep that in mind. Uh, and, and Warren, you got a good, a good explanation for that. Go ahead and yeah. tell us what you were looking to. Yeah, when you go and have a practice evaluated for purchase, let's say you have an owner of the practice. He only works two days a week. His associate works two days a week. The income they both generate is what you're paying to purchase. That, that will become your income if you're going to work four days a week. So that is the dental income of the practice. So that's how we look at it. Dental income, the rest is overhead. So national medium overhead, based on dental economics from the Levin Group, 75% for general dental offices, especially is at 74.9, overall 74.62. I'm not sure I believe that these numbers are accurate or not. I, I think it's more like 70% for general, maybe 65. I don't know. But that's what we're hearing here. That's what we're seeing, and so we're reporting it. Uh, and so the ideal target, um, here is, is uh, here we go. So the ideal, ideal target for most general dental offices, they say, is uh, 59%, and 40, 42 for endo, 49 for ortho, 49 for pediatric, 64 for pros, oral surgery's at 50%, it doesn't cost much to pull out a tooth. 51% <laughs> for scenario. And if you break it, if you look at our dental office, general dental office practices, and maybe it carries over to all, but the idea targets for these eight different sections or categories of expenses or overhead, 25% for staff wages, you can read the numbers, lab, supplies, equipment, rent, mortgage, marketing, business office, and miscellaneous. Take a picture of this, please. This is very powerful information. We're going to ask you to go and find your own numbers here in a little bit before we're finished with the webinar. You got to know, if you're going to mind your margins, you got to know where your money's going. You absolutely have to go. It's important to understand that. So if the average is 74, and the target that most people are saying you should shoot for is 59. We've got a different idea. You know, no one ever thought that running for a four minute mile was ever possible until someone did it. And then everybody did it. It was expected. We believe that the new four minute mile for practice overhead is 49%. Right, Brian? Right, Warren? Absolutely. That's right. I, 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 we, we talked earlier and, you know, I'm not quite there, but I know that I can get there uh, as we, as we've gone over my numbers and things, this, this four minute mile is definitely achievable. In fact, if you go to the next slide, uh, we have, we would like to get where everyone feels they, they are with their overhead. We have 300 participants on right now. And I think this poll would be really helpful for everyone to see where they feel like they're on with their overhead. So, uh, Sarah's going to run this poll, and we're going to see where everybody feels like they are. So go ahead and run the poll, Sarah. This is going to be really good information for everybody on to kind of see where their peers uh, feel like it is. And if you don't know exactly where it is, there is an option down there that says, I have no idea what it is. But maybe maybe try to take a guess uh, where you think you are. Um, you know, I, I love it. I love the honesty. If you don't know what your overhead is, it's impossible to set, it's almost like you, you, you don't weigh yourself every morning. If you don't check the scale and see where you are, you don't really know if you're eating too much or not enough or exercise more. Like you don't really know. You're just, well, life's good. I'm making enough money. And uh, I, it seems to be working out. I don't know my overhead. So if you don't know it, Mark, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Don't take a guess. Then. Don't uh, take a guess. Find out how many people have no idea. And, uh, we'll I don't know. Fly casual, right? Is that what we're doing? With the, <laughs> I don't know my overhead. I think a lot of people do that. Yeah, I know I have before. Yeah. I think we've got a good number of votes coming in. We're at 65%. 
So if you guys want to drop, if you haven't uh, participated in the poll, go ahead and do so right now. We're going to end the poll in here in just a second. Oh, there we go, over 200. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end and share those results. Let's see what they look like. Okay, that 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 kind of goes along. Kind of what we expected. Kind of, yeah, expected. I love the the idea that that uh, James brought up about the four minute mile. Right, for years and years and years, everyone wanted to run a five minute mile or four and a half minute mile, but to get that break that mark, now everyone's doing it. So the new mark, we're going to bump it down to forty nine percent. We want everybody there, and I think we can get there. I think even just this poll themselves, those that are in the 65 to 75, when they see that they have peers on this very phone call right now that are, are, are you got 2% that are between 35 and 45. You have 1% that's less than 35. You got 9% between 45 and 55. That extra 10%, 15% you can carve out, that's like buying yourself a whole nother week of production. Like that's like, like diagnosing a bunch more crowns and a bunch more implants. And like, you don't have to do all that extra work to make the same kind of money. That's right. It's a big, big deal. And that's the point we were trying to drive home. And well, that's a great poll. I, I, that, that's about what we thought though, wouldn't it? All right, let's move on. Okay. Uh, Warren, uh, let's see. Yeah. I, take so, yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're going to look at a couple of my, individual practices, two of them particularly, we'll call one practice A, one practice B. Out of the five that I own or have ownership of. Now um, you started 11, but you've sold off, right? Yes, so off. yes, I've sold out some of those over time, but I still own five practices. The average overhead is 42%. In, in practice A, it's 38%. Um, and in practice B, 30, 35%. So we're going to look at practice A. These two practices are interesting because they are basically within two miles of each other. So they're hitting the same demographic. Practice A was established 11 years ago, has two dentists, four hygienists, two front office, three assistants, and it takes, it's a preferred provider for every insurance. It just doesn't take Medicaid. But you know what taught me at OHSU? This sounds like a meat and potatoes dental practice. It, it is a meat and potatoes, <laughs> fillings, crowns, extractions. Every PPO, no Medicaid, all right. Yep, that's the kind of practice it is. And so uh, it's in a population of 107,000, median income is 63,000, and it gets about 50 new patients a month. It's located in a, in a good area, it has a nice busy street by it and surrounded by a residential neighborhood. Yeah, when people drive by, they can see it, right? Yeah, yep. absolutely. So. <laughs> We're going to be talking about dentist income and what do we call or define dentist income. Basically, it is every dollar that is paid to a dentist, whether they're an owner, a partner, or associate. That is dentist income. And in practice A, if we look at just the first quarter of this year, we had $476,000 of gross sales or revenue. And the overhead expenses for that practice were 168000 and the dentist income was basically 310000 Wait a minute, so, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me, how, did you just make these numbers up? I want to see your P&L. <laughs> I want to see the P&L. <laughs> show me the money. <laughs> we're going to show it to you. We're going to show it to you. Um, okay. So, yeah, practice overhead, 35%. Practice income, 65%. Way to go. Yeah. So... We look at practice A again, we can break it down. We have basically what those individual expenses are. Wait, wait, I'm going to interrupt you, Warren. These are those eight categories on that red slide I said, take a picture. And because yeah. you want to know where you were, you, you, can, you can group. We've done this enough, dental practices, we build enough, we own enough. You can group all of your supply, all of your expenses into one of these eight categories. The miscellaneous is the catch-all, catch-all. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we could probably carve out, you know, patient refunds and other stuff. And yeah, you, you got finance charges and miscellaneous yeah. credit card charges for the yeah. for the visa company. Uh, yeah. So, but these are the eight, and we have on the bottom of this tab down here twenty five eight that that was like the target the the target of of what dental economics and Levin and those guys are saying that you you should be targeting to have a a practice margin of fifty nine percent. Absolutely, or overhead of fifty nine percent. I mean. And you, you've done it. The middle column here is different. You're, tell us what those numbers are. What do you got? So this one equals 35%. If we go to that uh, practice A P&L, we can look at a little bit uh, okay. closer at the P&L. We actually get to see the P&L. And I'm going to click on that. It's going to open up. It's not doctored up. This is real. I'm going to click <laughs> on this. 
Now, it's all the office one. managers that are all, any office managers or staff watching right now, you got to walk away and you got to leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But all right. So I did. I did erase my partner's names just so. That yes, they, we call them Doctor A, Doctor B. All right. I'm going to click yeah. on that. A different web browser is going to pop up here. So just let me know if you can see it. Is it, can you still see the screen? Yeah, we're good. I can still see the screen. We can see the P and L now. All right. Excellent. Go ahead. You guide me, and I'll walk it through. Great. So basically, staff wages. Of course, it says 18.65 percent, but I'm also adding the taxes that we pay on employment taxes to that category. Yeah, you've got another ca category right here. You got taxes right here for tax employment. So you're bundling that 1.55 into, you know. Right. Absolutely. So, and you can see we got our dental supplies are at four percent, laboratory fees at three percent. Hold on, hold on. I just want to make sure people that are looking, watching from home. I've always wanted to say that. People that are watching from home, I want you to see that on March, that this is, you know, column J is March, and then column right. O is year to date. So we're focusing on year to date right we're now. We're focusing on year to date, yeah. Because some of those numbers were different in March. You know, it depends on when bills are paid and, and things. But yeah, the, the code. Um, yeah. so, um, and then if we go down, you know, we can see this office really pays nothing in advertising. We just don't advertise in the office. Some you guys office, are on a busy road. You still get 50 new patients. You don't need to advertise. Word of mouth. We, we use a banner that costs $300. Sits outside in the grass, you know. So, um, and uh, so those are our expenses. The partners that are in the office, we basically have a management fee, which is the profit sharing. There's two of us that are owners. That's the profit sharing right there. Um, there's also more profit in the 110,000 down below that hasn't been dispersed yet. Um, that was generated in March. And let's make sure we, let's make sure we clarify that. Yeah. So you, you've, you've carved out these management fees here and now you're, this is what the partners are getting here. And then this doctor is actually earning this over the last three months. This is for a whole quarter here. Last month yeah. was a really good month for that, for that doctor. Right. And that's, but you that's you still have another 110,000 of retained earnings that you just kept in the practice that you can distribute out to the owners, yeah. but you haven't yet. But it's those not will be yeah, those would be distributed the first week of April, and it just hasn't happened yet. So they're sitting in there in, in retained earnings. Yeah. So, yeah. Fantastic. Amazing. Real numbers. This is how you do it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <I'm> Warren, <laughs> I'm Warren, I've learned so much. I can't wait to implement this tomorrow. All oh, right. my goodness. <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, we can go back to the, the slide deck again. If most dentists on are listening that are, are like me, when I saw this P&L for the first time, I, I, I would feel a little bad. I thought, oh boy, I got to do a little bit. You know, it's the great thing is, is we want to share the knowledge so that everybody can achieve the same results. That none of this is proprietary. We just need to help each other out to be able to all run our practices in the same, same manner. So, all right. So that's where we were when we left off. We can go to the next one. James is just getting his screen back. I think James, you're on mute too. There you go. Sorry about that, guys. Somebody, uh, you know, at the dental office here. Just, uh, I'll get right back into it. At the dental office, uh, someone uh, joined the Wi-Fi network, and there was an IP address conflict. And there you go. All right, I'm back in. <laughs> Let me open the screen. All yeah, right. That's, as a dentist, you have to be a dentist and an IT manager, right? And a lot that's of right. Go. All right. Let's get it back in here. I'm presenting going back. Practice. So now we're on practice B. You can see my screen okay? Yep. We can see great. Okay. So okay. Tell us about B, practice B, Warren. Yeah. So practice B, like I said, they are only within two miles, but it's different. It's only been established two and a half years. One dentist. It's actually one dentist that works three days a week, and I work one day a week, but it basically makes up a four-day week. Uh, one dentist, one hygienist, one front office, and two assistants. And we are only a preferred provider for Delta, Regents, EHA, and Carrington. Uh, those are the only four. This is and a so great case great. study. You're, you're not getting as many new patients. You're getting 30 instead of 50. Yeah. But you're not signed up for every PPO. You're in the exact same town. You're two miles apart. Right. The okay. first year I was signed up for, for the first year and a half or more, I was signed up for every PPO and we were getting 50 to 55 new patients a month. When I decided not to be a provider for all those other insurances, we had no idea how much it would hurt us, but it took our new patient numbers down to 30, but our income went way up. So 
Now that, that is, now we're not recommending you do that for everybody. We just did a real case study because Warren has five practices and if this practice bombed, it didn't matter. <laughs> Right. Well, this is what I figured. I was like, I'm within two miles of each other. Why do we both need to take every insurance? You know, they'll yeah. just go down the street to the other one, hopefully. You're like McDonald's. You're building a metal practice every mile apart on every corner. So located on a busy street, and this is critical, yeah. I think. You're by Costco and Walmart, a lot of visibility. Yeah. You can see us. So Big visibility, you for sure. Okay. Yep. So the gross revenue uh, first quarter was basically $300,000, and our overheads Ed expenses were basically 115,000, and the dentist income for that practice was 185,000. So a little over, a little higher overhead. We're talking about 38% uh, versus 35%. But um, yeah, it's it's still a very healthy practice. How new is this practice? Two and a half years ago, we built it. it, it it'll be three years old in uh, July. And the other practice is how old? 11 years old. So you got 11 year old meat and potatoes, you got a three, two and a half year old brand new one, uh, and with overhead that's still 38.38. Fantastic. Right. Tell us about this again. Okay, so again, we can see those eight categories that we kind of said, what are our expenses? We have the, the target, ideal target that's printed in the literature, 25% for your staff. You can see we save a lot in staff wages. That is really the one category that is always your largest overhead expense. If you can manage your staff wages and do more with fewer staff, you're always gonna be a healthier business. Um, lab, we're, we're doing well there. We're about the same average in supplies, which is much more than practicing. And that's because we do implants at this practice. We do a lot of implants that, and that raises your supply cost because if you look at your implant fee and what you pay per implant, it's usually a pretty high percentage. Um, rent mortgage uh, is is uh, below national ideal targets, and yeah, that's pretty much. Hey, it. and your credit card fees are below miscellaneous is below the national target. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, that's the biggest one there is probably patient refunds, right? Yeah, yeah you have credit. all that. Yeah. All right. Let's let's open up the uh, P and L. Let me know if you can see the screen. Can you see it okay? I see it great. All right. We're yeah. again looking at the year to date, not March, but year to date. Column right. O. Okay, Warren. Yeah, so again, uh, staff wages, we, to get that 16% that you saw, we're adding the employment taxes to that number. Um, dental supplies and laboratory fees are, are good percentages. Um, you know, this, this, this office, though, we do pay for marketing in this one. We send out direct mail uh, every other month, and so we do, and we do get a good return. Anytime I I send out marketing. I want at least for every hundred dollars I spend to get a new patient. That's how I judge my marketing if it's working right. That's but, part of your hundred dollar rule, huh? It is part of the hundred dollar rule. So, and then if we look at uh, dental dentist income below, um, there's actually three dentists that um, help own this that own this practice together. So we're all profit sharing, um, which is the management fee. And then there's two of us that work here. Um, I work one day a week and then the other uh, doctor works three days a week. So this is an important little nugget, I think. And let me just explain it. Warren, and I know, I know how you do it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this yeah. is how we do it too. That if you are working in a dental office and you're also the owner and you have other partners too that are also owners of a practice and are part, partly owning, part, part, part owners, and they're also working in the practice, you get paid twice. You get paid once to do the work because someone's got to pick up the handpiece and get it done. Yeah. And, and, the, and then you also pay your stock dividend, essentially. You pay a management fee, you're calling it, at the right. end of the month. Absolutely. Based on percentages. Yeah. Yeah. So in some businesses, like you talk about, we, if we could walk away, what would that business generate and make money for us? How much would that be? So, um, and then, of course, in this practice, they have a, 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 a retained earnings of 66000 that would be distributed that first week of of April. Still profit, been. still profit. You might want to keep it in if you want to buy more equipment and things, but it's still profit. It's not expense. It's not overhead. Right. So, it's not right. overhead. It's yeah. Good. Fantastic. Real numbers. Really impressive. Let me, let me uh, go back to the webinar here. Give me one second and, and present and go back to presentation mode. Just one second here. It's coming up and now we're back in. All right. So here's the hundred dollar rule we, we talked about earlier is that every time I'm thinking about how am I managing my practice overhead, 
if you want to start to really dive into it, just look at ways that you can save $100. Find five different ways you can save at least $100 in your practice. It all adds up. If you start looking at every small expense to large expense, you will find a way to save money. If you just take some time to do it today or do it this week. Is this all you got? A hundred dollar rule? Is that all I, I joined up on the <laughs> webinar? I know it seems so obvious. <laughs> Wait, it, it's, obvious. it's obvious, James, but, but this is a key takeaway. So we did this, we put this webinar together this week. I actually did this in my office and I was so surprised to find how many one a hundred dollars that I could find. I feel like I found almost more than a thousand dollars just by sitting down with my front office and going through the P&L and looking at the different services that we have and different ways that I can find and add up a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars. That adds up to a, at least a thousand dollars this month. That's twelve thousand dollars in a year. Yeah, that so leads us right, right it's into definitely a take home. It's definitely a take home, James. It's a take home. Yeah. Okay. That leads it leads us into uh, this important KPI. Important key KPI stands for key performance indicator. A number you should know. A number you should write on a whiteboard. A number your staff should know. Everyone should know this. You got to know your hourly overhead rate. Uh, Warren put that in. You'll thank me later. So we we think it's like a time. We we actually think it's like a DeLorean in a way that has a flux capacitor in it because I know it's kind of tongue in cheek. But if you, do you know how much money you spend every hour that you are, in, that you have the lights on and the doors open? Do you know how much money you're burning to keep your practice up and going? That is your practice hourly overhead rate. And when you understand this, you now know a very powerful metric that you can then use in your mind to, to help make very critical uh, decisions and, and have critical conversations and, and it motivates you to, to actually do this mind your margin and save a hundred bucks here and there because uh, by, by, by knowing this uh, you know exactly how much your time is worth. And, and so if the chair is empty and no one's there, if it's $300 that you're burning, that's your, your practice hour overhead rate, then you know, it's costing you $300 to, to uh, have that super nice patient that you really love who wants to come in and meet you. And who likes to schedule appointments just to say hi? And you talk for an hour. You talk for an hour and a half. <laughs> Instead, take them out to lunch. <laughs> That's what you're saying, right, Warren? <laughs> the hour denture adjustment appointment. It's so expensive. Just, so you know exactly how much Taylor is going to cost you this afternoon, then, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, Warren. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us how you calculate it. Yeah. So basically, if you look at month to month, or take a quarter and look at what your average monthly overhead is, you find that dollar amount, you then look at your average hours your office is open per month, or you take one month if you want to. You divide the, the, the monthly expenses by the hours open, now you know what your hourly overhead rate is. So um, if you produce more money than what that hourly overhead rate is, that's when you make a profit. That's pretty that's obvious. But you spell, you spell it out like that. Now this number is, every, every month this number needs to be recalculated because it changes based on what you spent money on that month. And if you can start to see trends and map trends out and you can see it going down, you know there's more maybe you know, Christmas bonus at the end of the year if you align people that way or if you have some incentivized system that helps them. And that's for another webinar, a different, a different day. But these are actual numbers from practice A and B, Warren. You computed yeah. that. This was from last month or last quarter? Last quarter. Last quarter. Yeah. Cool. So, so yeah, A's are basically four hundred dollars, and B's basically three hundred dollars. Even though A has a lower overhead rate, uh, uh, practice overhead, um, it has more providers. It generates more production per hour. But that is what those hourly rates are for both practices. That's important to know. Keep that in mind. Now, keep it in mind as we go through the rest of this webinar. Okay, tell us about this. What is this fake imaginary office? This isn't one of yours, right? This is a fake one. I just basically took the average between those two. One was 400, one was 300. So I said, let's make an imaginary office. We'll pretend that the cost is $350 an hour. And that way I can break it down to determine how will I be profitable. So I can say to my hygienist needs to cover at least $100 an hour of that expense rate. And so I know my profit fee is $91. Our vitamins are 57. That seems very reasonable that she can at least cover 
a hundred dollars an hour, especially because some procedures are more more expensive. SRP, perio maintenance, she might be doing sealants. And so that leaves me, if she takes care of a hundred dollars an hour, that leaves me $250 an hour as the doctor that I need to produce or exceed producing in order to make profit. So in no way are we suggesting that you, where's my, where's my MBA, my MBA hat? I got to put it on. <laughs> for this. No way are we suggesting that you take off your, you know, your doctor, your doctor hat when you're in the chair and you put on your MBA hat while you're in the chair. You don't do that ever. We wear two hats. Right. We have two different roles. We're doctors. We're healthcare providers. We don't do stuff that's not necessary, period, ever, period. End of line, right? Right. Uh, you take care of patients. You follow the golden rule. That's how you're successful. Word gets out when you do it the other way, and you blow up and implode in just a matter of time. So you don't right. go there ever. Not only for that reason. It's just not the right thing to do. Right. But you got to then, there are times where you put your doctor hat away when you're not in the operatory. You put on your MBA hat when you're at the computer doing a webinar, and you think about what exactly it is I need to do, and how do I then strategize and, and help people know that this is where we have to go. Can we schedule appointments for a denture adjustment for an hour and a half that brings in 50 bucks or maybe brings in nothing. Right. When I'm scheduling an appointment, can I, do I have, I mean, I, can I, is it easier now for me to convince my staff? If my staff knows I have to do at least 250 in order for us to reach our goals, uh, that they're gonna have to work a little harder and we're gonna have to do some quadrant dentistry or maybe we do the whole side of the mouth in an hour because we can uh, even though the staff might not want us to because it's more work for them. But when they start to see these numbers and understand the big picture, and then when you can align financial incentives to it, magic starts to happen. Everyone's involved, not just you. Everyone wants to hit the, everyone wants to understand how, to, how we can do you're, this the right way. You're right. right on the right track, James, because when your front office understands this and somebody cancels, now they understand why it's so important to fill that spot. Yeah. Right? They can't yeah. just let it go empty. It's got to be filled. You can start using this even when they come and ask for raises once a year. Well, look at our hours. We're blowing. It's 300 bucks an hour and all these empty holes. And you say no one wants to come on Saturdays <laughs> like because <laughs> you don't want to work it. Like, I can't give you a raise until we have more money. And when we have more money, uh, yeah, we'll share more too. So we're all, we all win. Um, so give us another obvious here, another obvious takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you bet. So there's only two ways to make yourself more profitable. One is you have to decrease that average hourly overhead rate, or you have to increase your average hourly production rate. That's it. That's the only now, this way. This is to make so more money. simple. This is so simple. You all know this, but most of us focus on increasing our hourly average production rate. I just went through a. Uh, I just went through a whole. Uh, with just the last five minutes, I talked about how we can increase our, our increase our rate by keeping our schedule more full and and uh, you know doing more dentistry uh, per hour. But but just as powerful is that decrease in your hour, your expense, and what you burn. Yeah. Get paid more for working less. That's what Get you paid more for working less. See, we go we go to the webinars or we go to the seminars. We learn how to place implants. We buy a Cirrus machine. We do more. It's, we spend a bunch more money so we can increase our our hourly production rate, but we don't do the heavy lifting that's actually pretty simple when you just think about it, that doesn't allow, that, that doesn't require as much continual effort to decrease your expenses. Yeah. I mean, how much software is out there, uh, guys, that, that teach us how to do more hourly production rate? Uh, it, it's, it's all out there. That seems to be the thing they always hit and hit. It's important, but don't forget number one as well. That's the pro tip. All right, that's the takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> There's another obvious one. Yep. <laughs> Nothing is more expensive than empty chairs. That's the most expensive overhead you have. <laughs> chairs are empty. Uh, Brian, did you put this picture on? I know you live down by the prison. <laughs> down in, uh, oh, like you don't want to pick up. Where'd you get that pick? There are some things that are just obvious, and so keeping your schedule full is one of them. Uh, yeah. You know, we're beta testing a new service called eAssist Full Schedule. We help you keep your schedule full. Uh, when it's not, and if you would like to learn more, you can you can email or call our number. But tell us about this this private uh, this this fake office here that you yeah. just put in there. What do you got here? What about this pizza? So so basically now, uh, if you know your overhead is three hundred fifty dollars an hour, if your staff comes and says it's so and so's birthday, can we go take a two hour lunch? I mean, what does that lunch really cost? Is the price of lunch plus three hundred fifty dollars of expenses? So. 
Yeah, you know, it might be better just to say, hey, let's order pizza and let's give so-and-so a $100 gift card or a $200 gift card for their birthday instead. You still, still come, come out ahead. ahead. You still come out ahead. <laughs> yeah, and that's how ahead. you think, Warren, this is your paradigm. This is how you're able to drive a 38% profit uh, in overhead uh, because you think like that all the time. And, and there's, a, there's a scientific or an economic term for this. It's called opportunity cost. And, and probably half of our audience has seen it, understands this principle. It's econ 110 stuff. Uh, and, and so this is why vacations are also very, 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 very costly when you don't have an associate and you close the office down. Because once you know your, your hourly production uh, overhead rate, your, pra your hourly practice overhead rate, you now know your opportunity cost every single hour that goes by that you're not open. So if, if it's $350, like in this case of the fake Acme uh, uh, Dental, Dental Co, and you're normally open for 10 hours a day, you're, you know, you're losing $3,500 every single day uh, in opportunity costs by going on a vacation for a day. So if you go on a vacation for a whole week, it's the, it's the airfare plus the Disneyland plus <laughs> $3,500 every single day you're closed. You can't do it. Brian and I would always joke, it's like, if you don't have an associate, you're building a prison brick by brick by brick. Right? You can't <laughs> yeah. ever leave. You can never leave. I would fly home from Disneyland just to just to work the day. Oh, well, honey, this is one expensive day. I just got home from the airport. Answer. I'm running to work. It was cheaper to buy the airplane ticket just to keep my office running. It does change everything when you understand when you have this kind of knowledge and you think like this. Okay. Yeah. And so this, again, is that same calculation, James, that we talked about earlier. If you have your P&L and you can figure it out, figure out what that monthly overhead expenses are, divide it by the number of hours you were open, and now you know you're ready. Take a picture of that, we're about to do a poll. Brian, this is your cue, this is your up, Brian. It's right right on, so, so, this, so everybody take a few minutes here, and Sarah's gonna pop up the, the numbers there, there's gonna be some choices there, right? Um, what is your hourly overhead rate? Sarah, do you have a poll? There we go, okay, so we have multiple choices, we the one thing, the one thing we're missing on here is I don't know. I have never calculated. <laughs> we missed that on the poll. Uh, we really did. Probably that's an half, important one. More than half would get that, right? Uh, I know that I would have put that. So if we, you just we take can, a minute, um, we're going to give you maybe a little bit longer, maybe thirty seconds, to just kind of give us a pretty good answer on that, and I'd like to see where it is. Warren, where was yours? What, would, what was your number at? So I had one office at 300 and one office at 400 for those two offices that we looked at. So we can assume, we can assume because there's only 77 people that voted on this, that all the rest of them don't yeah. know. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. This is a good number to figure out. Okay. Yeah, let's let's uh, go ahead and shut the poll. Let's see what it says. Uh, all over the board, but pretty much where, where you're at, Warren, is the big one. Yeah. Uh, more than $600. That's interesting. Uh, there's, there's a good chance there, 15%. 18% on 450 to 500. And some people are doing less than 300. They're all over the board, but that is, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting poll. Well, the, the biggest one, though, guys, really, I mean this. We had 220, 202 people that voted in the last poll out of the 350 that are on. We only had 78 or, or 80 voted for this one, I think. Uh, I think that's what it was. So the rest of them, the bulk of this is I don't know what it is. And, and so for those of you that know, at least that's a start in the right direction. The rest of you, we got to figure this out. That's step number one. The step number two, for those that know what it is, we got to get it down. We got to get it lower and we're going to help you over the next couple of webinars. Uh, what we, we're about to teach you next is about negotiations, which is, is we think the fundamental, like, go ahead and stop sharing it, uh, Sarah. And that we think this is the fundamental, uh, the foundation of, of, driving and minding your margins, ensuring that you're not, you're asking people, can you give me a discount? Ryan, what was it that you taught me when I was your, your associate? Okay, uh, to negotiate <laughs> when I was, when you were, when I was your associate. Oh, I can't remember. You, right. you, no, you said anytime anyone asks, you say, can, can you do a little better? Is that, that the best pause. You can do? Is, that, is that the best you can do? And then you just got to pause. There's a lot more. We have some scientific stuff. We have names like Batna, Zopa. We're going to get into all the anchoring. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk a little bit about how, how other businesses look at uh, how healthy or how valuable a business really is. This is important to understand because we have been shortchanging ourselves as dentists for the last whatever years by evaluating our practice in a completely different way based off of revenue. 
uh, 0.8% of revenue or something. Give me a break. Like, like no businesses that value Amazon is not worth 0.8% of their revenue. They're working worth a heck of a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right. So these are two important terms that if a VC firm contacts you or you're, you're, you're reading the wall street journal, or you really want to get serious about like minding your margins, you got to know that this is how most companies uh, uh, think about profitability. Uh, most, you know, dentists are unique because we, not only are we building a business, we're also creating a job for ourselves. And so, but a real business, you don't have to, to actually do any work except, you know, that actually generates uh, income. You just mine, you manage the, the people that are generating the income. That's, that's how a business functions. And so this term EBITDA is an acronym for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And probably half of you have heard this before if you've gone to any other uh, d business uh, lectures about dentistry and how to understand and how to read your P&L, your profit and loss statement. Um, and so, but we often just talk about what's our gross production and what's our net production, right? So let me just, let's just think like dentists and that's okay. Instead of talking about EBITDA, let's talk about what's our, what's our net profit margin. It's important to know that. Uh, it's different than the overhead uh, percent that we've been just throwing around because we're including, we're excluding all dentist income that the, the practice is producing from our overhead. When we talk about overhead, we're just thinking of expenses because most of us you know, are, are working, are, are own our own practices, are, are, are sole proprietors, might not have an associate. Maybe we do, maybe we don't, but those are the things we can focus on is those eight different variables uh, that, uh, that actually have a lot of uh, room to go. And, and Warren's examples of practice A and B uh, showed us exactly how much more you can make when you do mind those margins in those eight areas. So net profit margin is different than EBITDA in this way. Net profit margin is how much money you're actually taking home at the end of the day after you pay taxes, uh, after you bought, you know, whatever it is you bought uh, that can be capitalized. With EBITDA, it's not that way. That, that by capitalization, we'll, we'll explain that in another, another webinar, but if you don't understand it, it just means if I'm buying equipment like, like uh, the big picture is if I'm buying like a, a, a milling machine, an E4D, and that, that, that's not really an expense. It's, you paid money out. It's a cash flow issue. You got money going out, but it's putting some on your balance sheet. And so you, you can only expense what you can depreciate every single year until you've depreciated the entire uh, outflow of cash for it. But we don't even know all that stuff. It's not really important. But know that it's out there. And so when you're having conversations with VC firms, you got to study up a little bit, know these terms, understand what net profit margin is. And so if you want to calculate your net profit margin, this will give a true sense of what kind of a business you've created because some of us have associates, some of us don't. And so if you actually don't, if you can walk away for three months or for a whole year and not pick up a handpiece, it's a little bit different than just overhead. Like what we described, you're, you're going to want to include all the doctor expense and all the associates expense. And that's how you help determine what your net profit margin is, including how much you're paying on taxes and everything else. And so to do that, you take your overhead expense, again, take a picture of this if you want to do this. Uh, in a minute, you can see the net margins of, of companies like Walmart's 3.12, Amazon last year was 7.4, Amazon two years ago was 3.4. So if you want to like, like equate yourself and see how good of a business you've built compared to other industries, you got to know your net profit margin. And that's how you do it. I won't go into any more details. Just follow that formula figure out your net profit margin, and then compare it to like Marriott, they're 5.19. McDonald's Corporation, the real corporation, not the franchisees, is 20%. Okay. They're in the real estate business. Watch that movie Founder, you'll see how. Uh, the yeah. Mayo Clinic though is 5.1. Dr. Willis's practice A is 27.2. That is quite a business you built, Warren. Yeah. And that is why your business shouldn't be just evaluated on a point eight of revenue. Right. right. We, yeah, it's the way practices when we sell them for years, James, as dentists, because uh, we, we're not taking this into consideration. Right. Basically, it is, James, the way, exactly what you're saying is, if I don't have to be there and I just replace myself so that someone else does the dentistry and I pay them, how much profit is left at the end of the day? What do I take home yeah. if I don't have to be there? If you're Bruce Wayne... And, and you don't have to do anything. If you're in the Bahamas, let's do that. If you're in the Bahamas without the COVID, no, no, we don't want to, if you're at home in, in quarantine, uh, how much money are you making when you're putting all the other guys at risk? Is that what you're saying, Warren? I, just, but I, I, get, I, get, where, I get where you're going, and that's important to understand. Uh, when selling your practice, this is the takeaway. This is one of the pro tips we want to say. 
Uh, Warren, you've done this now a few times. Explain exactly. Yeah. Now, so the, so when I do this, when I have a partner that says, hey, I want to come and, and, and buy in, I look and say, okay, what is that net profit margin? You know, is it $30,000 a month um, and you want to buy in for half the practice? And I would take that $30,000 and I would times that by 12 to get my annual profit. And then after I have my annual profit, I would multiply that by eight years. And the reason why eight years is a multiple I've heard bounced around with a lot of good, healthy businesses before. Yeah. And if you use eight years, basically he can go get a practice loan for 10 years and he doesn't, you know, he'll probably won't even have to spend the entire profit amount that he now gets. If he buys 50% and gets 15,000, he probably has to spend $12,000 a month for 10 10 years to pay that loan off. And those profits will go up too. So I feel that's a fair evaluation. I take those, those profits, the monthly profits, I find out what the annual amount is and times it by eight years. And that's, that's where I determine the value to buy so, in. So most VC firms, like if they are looking at another business in a different industry, that's not dentistry, for instance, they'll ask for EBITDA. That's the annual profit before the taxes, depreciation and amortization. That's really how healthy the business is and what does it generate to the shareholders or the owners. And they times it by some multiple. And it depends on the industry, what multiple they're going to use. Eight is an average multiple. Uh, 12 or 16 or 15 or 20 software companies are like 20 as uh, 15, sometimes 22, depending on how fast they're growing. So this is actually pretty just falls in line with how businesses are bought and sold in the world and in free markets. And we've been ignoring this as dentists. And so we're trying to tell you there's a better way. There's a different way. We're going to have a whole nother webinar about this in the future too. Right, Warren? We just, yeah, absolutely. We haven't talked about it, but we will. Uh, so the, it all goes back to the foundation we just laid. It's important you know your, your, how much money you're spending and every $100 counts and, uh, and understand what it costs every hour to be open because that'll increase your EBITDA, which increases the valuation of your practice when you go, if you ever do have an exit, if a VC firm ever knocks on your door or, or another dentist knocks on your door that you've been, you've been teaching. And now you've got a real opportunity there to uh, not be taken advantage of and not take advantage of anyone else. Like this is just f a fair deal. Fair deal. And you, you mind your margins. You've got the most out of what you built. It's the way to do it. So let's recap. We're setting a new standard. We believe so strongly that new overhead should be 49%. So if someone asks, hey, what should, the, what should my overhead be? Because they're trying to set a goal. You don't accomplish anything without a goal. You say 49%. That's what it is. In order to make better decisions, you need to know your practice hourly overhead rate. We hope you do that. And of course, nothing is more expensive than empty chairs in your practice. You got to be thinking about opportunity costs all the time. So now that if you've saved some money, you really are buying time. And this is why we call this, this uh, understanding this variable a time machine. <laughs> I know it's kind of tongue in cheek, but understand that when you understand your practice time and what it's worth, what your time is worth and, and what it costs to have your practice uh, not be generating revenue, what it actually costs to have it open, it influences all of your decisions, even the small ones. And when you buy extra time because you're now saving money because you're willing to get on that phone and take the, and have the courage to ask someone to give you a bigger discount than they're giving you now, or you're, 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 you're cutting out some software that, or some, uh, some, uh, some marketing something that you're not really sure really gives a return. You think it does it's the way you've always done it. It's the way dad did it. Like by mining your margins and ensuring that every hundred dollar counts, you're now, you, you have an opportunity because now you don't have to work as much and make the same amount of money. You could work more and make more, or you just now spend that time doing things that you really want to do with your life. So like you are buying an extra week, <laughs> perhaps every single month to decide what to do with, to make more money or spend more time with those you love, right? Anyone okay. add that? It, it works both ways there, James, too, because if you have a patient that comes in and they want to negotiate with you, but they have a big case, and it's a case you want to do, but maybe they don't want to pay your full fees. Well, if you know your overhead costs and you know how much it costs for them to be there an hour, and you know how long it's going to take you, well, you're in a much better place to say, yeah, you know what, I'm going to take that case on because I'm, going to, I'm actually still going to make a lot of money there. Yeah. And, and do something yeah. I enjoy. So, you know, it gives you, it gives you a whole, a whole new thing. And I, and I love the, what, what both of you have said is take that number and write it down. And whether you write it down in front of the office or put it, put it in front of 
uh, your, your office manager so that everybody knows, look, this is how much it costs to run every hour of this office. Yeah. Increase your pro so now let's get into uh, pro uh, number one, uh, the root of probably the reason why most of you decided to join this webinar today. And we hope we haven't disappointed yet. I mean, we just laid a foundation for the five big things that when you have your, your MBA hat on, your dental MBA hat on, that you got to do to mine your margin and increase your profits. But you got to understand the foundation for all that in order for this stuff to be really, really valuable. And so here they are. Warren? Yeah. This is your baby. Go you ahead bet. and read it off. You bet. The first one is don't be afraid to negotiate everything. Everybody will negotiate a little bit. I guarantee you, if you call up anybody you're paying, your lab or something like that today, and just tell them this, I mean, this is a perfect opportunity. We just went through this COVID crisis. Hey, I just need a better discount in order to keep doing business with you. They, they'll negotiate, I guarantee it. Um, eliminate operational bottlenecks, implement best practices for streamlining and increasing your efficiency. That's another great way to make money. And sometimes you have to spend money to make money. That's what we talked about with the marketing. I didn't have to do any marketing in one practice, but the other one I do because it actually does generate money for me. I have to spend money on advertising. And then um, obvious is collect 100% of what you're rightfully owed. If you don't collect 100%, your overhead is going to skyrocket. So. so we're going to dive deep into number one. Don't be afraid to negotiate everything. Here we are. But why we, why, we, why we talk about negotiation, when I think of the negotiations, I think of some slimy, now my dad was a used car, my granddaddy had a used car sales lot up in Idaho, so I, can't, I don't feel bad about, used car salesmen, they, those guys are great. I love my daddy, I was granddaddy, I was named after him. But keep in mind that that's not what we're saying is, we, you're not trying to like break the other person lose and you win. Uh, you got to understand there's some big picture concepts we'll talk about in one moment. We'll, we'll also introduce the academic uh, concepts and principles that when you understand what you're doing, like already in your mind, and you write it out on paper, you're much less emotional when you negotiate. You can keep it in control. You can be logical. The epinephrine doesn't start to drip, and you can make better decisions. It's important you understand that. And then we're going to share real life dental experiences that we've all had as we've negotiated. But before we do that, yeah, let me cut you off there, James, because I know I know you start to get into the negotiating. I, I look at Warren. Warren loves to negotiate. He's good at it. He likes it. I, I don't really like it. Um, it. It does do exactly what, what you said. The epinephrine starts to, to flow. I start, I start, you know, getting nervous about, okay, is they going to accept this or not? But we're going to talk about some strategies that's helped me and, and, and that. But we're going to ask, the, first of all, the poll. I want to see how many of you out there like to negotiate if they like. Uh, so we, we'll use that as a quick poll, give, give us a little bit of a, a headway into our next uh, segment on, on negotiations. A lot you know, more Brian, people are voting now. I have one brother that's a dentist and he hates to negotiate. If I asked him and gave him this assignment to go and negotiate, he would leave town. <laughs> he hates it that bad. <laughs> I don't hate it that bad, but, but it's not, you know, it, is, it does make you feel uncomfortable. You want to get it set in stone. Okay, we have, are we close there, Sarah, with that being finished? Yeah. Yep, we got 57% who have voted. A lot more people voted here, so I'm going to go ahead and close that one down and share the results. Not my Look favorite. at that. Look okay. at that. Oh. Most people don't like it. I, th I think that's, uh, that's probably a fair and a truthful answer. There's, there's little Warrens out there and, and a lot of me's, but... <laughs> well, we're dentists, right? We're all nice guys. We want to make everybody happy. That's, that's why we right. chose this profession. So I, I really believe that though this is a skill, this, 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 this goes back to why you need to know that hourly production number. Because when you know that number, you will now have the courage to negotiate. Because you realize how much every $100 is costing you in time. That's the point I want to make. If you can negotiate a savings of 350 bucks a month, you just bought yourself one more hour of your life where you don't have to be prepping a, a number two, uh, an MOD on number 15. For instance, like you, you just bought an hour of your life back to either do more dentistry or do something else. So when you start, most of us are making sufficient for our needs and we're making enough money and we don't want to make more. Yeah, but it's not the end all end all anymore. It what back in dental school, we were 69 cent bean burritos, but it's different now for most of us. And so it's, this is, but you want to equate it to time. That's why we go back to this time machine stuff. Uh, you, those of you that avoid it like a plague and those of you that say it's not my favorite, but I want to, if I have to, 
if you understand that number, you'll become a pro. That's our, that's our theory. We're sticking to it. If you understand how much time you're buying by knowing that number, you're going to want to do it over and over and over and over again. And you start, you're going to start getting these kind of uh, margins, overhead margins, like what Dr. Willis has in time. You'll wake up one day and go, man, where did this come from? Well, it came from you. All right. That's good. So I just went through this. Now it's important you understand Stephen Covey in his book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks about thinking win-win and, and you always have a number five is you, you always want to make sure that you're, you're being respectful when you're negotiating with people and you find a common ground that uh, a third alternative, he calls it, where it's not, I win, you lose, you lose, or I win. That's not negotiation. That's not true negotiation. That's not what we're recommending here. But you listen enough to understand each other's wants and you find a common ground so that you walk away as friends. There's no reason, you don't want to go, true negotiation isn't you tick off the other guy and the guy's such a jerk and by the time you hang up, you got what you wanted, but the guy tells all of his friends, Dr. Anderson is a jerk. Stay away from that guy, I hate that guy. You don't want to do that. You want to think win-win. But Warren, this is, this is your idea. You, you said something about, you'll be surprised that, what, most everybody what? Everybody will give you a break. I, I'm, I'm 99% confident if you approach them in the right manner, you know, and explain it in a win-win, you bet. They'll give you some kind of break. I don't care if it's 2%, you know, off your lap bill. <laughs> They'll give you something if you ask. Yeah, you gotta ask. Okay, let's talk about some terms you need to know. There's four of them uh, that uh, are, th yeah, th four of them uh, when, you, when you study negotiations and you, and you can take online courses about how to become a better negotiator. You can take a business class at your local university close by on how to, when they open up again, on how to negotiate better. And those are great exercises because you're actually like role play negotiation with other people. I highly recommend it. One of the things they'll teach you is you got to know before you start any exercise, and you already kind of do this in your head, but if you were to think about it, now that you know what it's called and you write it down, what is my best alternative to a negotiated deal? If I don't reach a deal, where can I go next? If you know that, you're going to be able to keep your emotions in control because you know exactly before you even start the negotiations how low you're going to go. This is the bottom line. Like if you're negotiating a lease, for instance, or a buyout or a different uh, lab and you have three labs that are all good, like you, you know where other alternatives are. You got to write it down. You got to make sure you negotiate anything. You know you're bad. Simple concept. You already kind of know it in your head and your heart, but write it down. Think it through. Like if you know how to figure out how to do a root canal, molar endo, you can do a batna. It's, not, it's no big deal. <laughs> Next, you got to map out the negotiation space. Now, this is really fundamental. This is so critical, I believe, in keeping your emotions at check and thoughtfully coming up with the game plan before you make that phone call or before you go out to lunch and start to negotiate. This will, this will turn all those who say, I hate it, it scares me to death, uh, uh, that much closer to becoming a pro. Uh, this, this will help those who say, hey, I avoid it, but I do it anyway. You'll start to love it, like Warren. Yes. Because I, I believe so strongly that when you understand what all the various items are that you're negotiating, like for a lease, for instance, uh, and you think about what is, and you think about it from the other person's point of view, that's that's number two of negotiating or mapping out the space. Is you write out what are all the items we can negotiate. It's the price, right? You got the price per square foot. You have the term. You you have maintenance. Who's going to own the air conditioner? Who's going to fix the roof if it leaks? Uh, tenant improvement allowance, how much money I'm going to get, $40 a square foot. Warren, you had one where you got $100. You got a 100% tenant improvement allowance from wow. one of your guys, right? I didn't 100%. even expect it. I thought I, the first thing we talked about, we were throwing out some terms, and I you know, realized I just got an impression that he was planning on paying for all the entire uh, improvement space when, when he was talking to me. And so I was like, okay, so you're going to pay for everything, correct? Yes, I'm gonna pay for everything. See, and okay. like a pro, like a pro, you hooked him, like a pro, and and he's, you guys were still friends afterwards, right? Sure. Yeah. He didn't feel like it was a win-win. All you got what he wanted, you got what you wanted, but you were more intelligent in your approach, and you didn't even realize what you were doing. You didn't write it out, but you knew it. Like internally, you already had this skill. Maybe it's because you were you're the youngest of five kids, and you always had to negotiate for food. <laughs> food. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But another thing we're missing here is like, do I have an option to buy the building? Is there a lease option? There's lots of, you can like think through what is the negotiation space of every negotiation you're doing. And then you start to say, 
where am I going to negotiate in each one of these? Knowing that you're not going to go line by line by item by item by item by item. You're going to negotiate the whole package as one deal. So if they give some over there, you give some over here. But when you map out the whole space, you can logically now think it through and not get the epinephrine going like, what do I got to do? Yeah, whatever you want. Like it's just a much easier way to approach something to like logically think about it. Remember that you got to negotiate the collective. <laughs> Collectively negotiate everything. And so another takeaway, another nugget. <laughs> negotiate the Borg. Like Dr. <laughs> hey, Brian, I'm sorry. You didn't know I was doing this. We need to do a poll to see how many people really even understand that. <laughs> uh, well, so let me go back here. So the collective is, remember, you know, when you map out the space, you have all these various items in every negotiation that you're going to be focusing on. But there's a tendency, like what Warren just did, to go line by line and negotiate each one at a time. Oh, are you going to pay leasehold improvement allowance? No, I'll do $40, $40 a square foot. Okay, I'll do 60 Okay, I'll meet you halfway. I'll do 50 Okay, oh, let's go to the next one. What's the price per square foot? It's 20 Okay, well, I want 15 Okay, we'll go 17 You see what that is? That's not negotiating the Borg. That's not negotiating like the Borg does it. <laughs> Dr. Borg, the first time I met you, you know, I said, are you like the, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you said resistance is futile. Yeah, resistance is futile. <laughs> so that's when you tell the person who's negotiating who wants to go line by line, look, resistance is futile. You yeah. cannot negotiate the without the collective here with me. <laughs> All right, the next important term to know when you negotiate is after you've mapped out the space, is what is my ZOPA? What that means is, and you can read it, what is my, what is, what is my, uh, is, is it's a zone of possible agreement that I'll give this much and I'll take this much, but, but I won't go any more than this. This is, I'm going to ask for this much and I'll go as low as this in each of these various categories. So think about this. You're coming up with a ZOPA on each one of these. Like what is my zone that I'm going to start negotiating at? What's my starting point? What's my bottom point? Now the other person's probably done something too. They're not as intelligent as you on negotiating. And so they're, they're, they're not going to like it either. And they're going to have emotions and because they haven't thought, it, unless they're a pro. And so if you can find some area of agreement where you want to go, like in Warren's case, his Zopa was 100% of the leasehold improvement allowance will be paid by the guy. And you would have gone as low as what? 20%? $20 a square foot? 40? Yeah, I, I wanted 40. I always want minimum of 40. So I would have listened to him if he, if he said 40, is it okay? You know, maybe now, I would have said, is that the best you could do? see if I could get a little bit more out of them, but I would have been acceptable at 40. 40. So your, Zo your Zopa for that, for that was, was, 100, uh, was 40 to 100, 100%. 100%. And his was, just, his was just, you know, his was just 100%. And so you guys, you guys mapped up. That was the zone. You guys, you guys agreed on something. And I know it's academic, but it's important to understand uh, that there's this zone that all parties have in all the spaces. And if you can find a way to map out and collectively bargain everything and don't, don't take the bait to go line by line by line, don't do it. You'll get a bad deal. And you'll also emotionally like, like hate it. But think of the whole package as one. Find an area we guys agree, shit, you, you, you agree on. This is what we went through here. And, and you're going to you're gonna enjoy this and you're going to get a much better deal. Next. James, lawyers call that cherry picking. Oh, but, but we, we, we try to avoid the same thing, depending on what side you're arguing and what you're trying to get. I, th I thought you were taking a nap, Taylor. I thought you <laughs> This is riveting. Are you kidding me? I thought you were in the bathroom. All right. Well, I'm glad that you were listening. So ch lawyers do this on purpose. I knew you guys knew what you were doing. You guys cherry pick stuff. Why? See so, if the guys take the bait. You'll say, hey, no, wait, we're not going to cherry pick. Let's go through the issues. And then we got to we got to negotiate it collectively, depending uh, on what side it. of the agreement you're on. Yeah, they should have taught this in, this in dental school. They never taught it. No. Oh, well. But we, we're teaching it to you now. Now, the next thing, too, the last term you got to understand is anchoring. This is a concept when you first hear it. It's like, what? I don't know if I agree with that. But I promise you, do a little Google research. You will find study after study after study after study. If you take one of these courses, uh, they'll do an anchoring exercise, and you will learn firsthand in real time how valuable it is to be the first person who says, this is the offer. That's what anchoring is. You don't, don't be kind and say, well, what do you think? When you do that, because you're not certain, you're giving them a chance to anchor you. And you guys are going to go plus negative on the anchor, but you're not going to go a lot higher than the anchor or a lot lower than the anchor. Unless, you're, unless the term you throw out there is so egregious that the person's like, nah, I'm not going to accept that. In their mind, like, you're not anchoring me. That's what they're doing emotionally, even though they don't think, they don't realize that that's what they're really doing. 
You I no 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 no. It's really this, and then they anchor you. So you don't want to be so far out there that it doesn't make any sense at all. But if you can be the first person to have enough courage, you, you've mapped out the space, you know your batna, you know your zopas for each of your things. You're you're going to go and collectively bargain, and like Dr. Borgwood. And, and then you anchor and you lead with that, you're gonna get a much better deal. Mm-hmm. Much better deal. Okay, if you wanna learn more about these things, one of my professors at HBS wrote this book, Deepak, and you can find it on Audible too, Negotiating the Impossible, highly recommend it. Uh, it'll teach you more about everything that I've been teaching you now. Okay, now let's get into the 12 different categories here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward here, there's 12 of them. Boom, 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 I'm going real fast here. Here they all are, here's the icons for all 12 of them. These are things that every dental office should negotiate. Every single one of you needs, needs to do this this week. Time is of the essence here. We're going to go through each one of these one by one and talk about how we've been able to negotiate in each one of these in the various categories and give you ideas that you should do when you map out the space for each one of these items. Okay, number one. Warren, would you mind explaining this? You've done sure. this really well. Yeah, I've done several leases, and so – Anytime you're negotiating a lease, there's several items that you can negotiate. One is the tenant improvements that we just talked about. What is that tenant improvement allowance? Um, your option to purchase the building, that's really important. You know, usually they're going to want to charge you a little bit more if you're going to have that option to, to, to buy. Um, the time of the lease, that's often really important to landlords, but a lot of times us as dentists, we think, I'm going to be here for many, many years, you know? So that's a great bargaining chip on your side because the landlord just wants someone that he knows is going to be there for a long time. And then price, um, your common area maintenance charges, uh, those are usually passed on to you, but you want to keep those in check. Say those can increase more than X percent per year. Even if they do increase, I want to be locked in and protected. You can't just redo the parking lot every single year and re-asphalt it because you don't like it. Um, and then the air conditioning maintenance and um, ability to sign a, a sublease to someone would be things you would negotiate. Now, here's a nugget that buying the, the best thing I did in some of my leases, and I didn't do it in my most recent one, was that option to buy. What I said is after 10 years, I want to be able to buy this building from you. I should just bought it from day one. You do that now, Warren. But I was yeah. afraid. I was a young dentist. I, I had a bunch of debt. I wasn't sure if it was going to work. I realize now the, the risk, the, the best approach is you don't, it's just as risky to have a lease because you still got to pay it even if, you, if your office goes under. If you own it, it's less risky because you have an asset you can then sell to somebody else and get out of it. So like buying it, if you can get finance, is actually, even though you have more debt on your balance sheet uh, and you're walking around in your mind, I got more debt, it's less risky because you own an asset you can then sell if things don't work out. But by putting in your lease, I want an option to buy that in five years or 10 years for whatever market value is at that time. And we'll both you know, agree what that is by some independent, some whatever. Now you're not, the only time you can do that is before you sign the lease. Brian, you tried to do that after you signed your lease and it was a no-go. It was a no-go and it's gotta be in writing. And I will say that I have a list of 10 mistakes that I've made, my 10 biggest mistakes as a dentist. And that is one of the top ones is that I was not able to negotiate that in writing they turned around and sold it to somebody else even though they knew I wanted it and man that has just burned me and it it sits on me and it's something you got to have in writing and it's something you should definitely negotiate uh, when you're doing a lease yeah now the option you don't have to do it even even right now with with COVID hitting and everybody Uh, I would love to have owned my office with an SBA loan I set it up that way I know I know (laughs) I, I, I I I set up my lease so that it could transfer into an SBA loan and they promised me and they, they gave me email after email after email that I would have first right of refusal, but it wasn't in the lease contract. And the lawyers got me, T- Taylor got me on that one, so. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is even now though, that most of you are starting new practices right now on this phone call, but or on this webinar, but you can uh, still go and negotiate your lease right now. And that's what we're saying. There's all these things you can do. You can pull, bring it to the negotiation table and say, look, things are different. This is a crisis. We got it. This isn't going to work. And most people are going to listen to you. I, I own some buildings now, and if I'm right, right next door, there's a Thai restaurant. If they were to come to me and ask me, I'd probably lower their lease. But they haven't, so I hope they're not listening. I hope they're not listening right now. Okay. James, I, will, I will say just real quickly, you know, the, negotiating the lease may be an area for some, especially if they don't like negotiating, where you, you know, it makes sense to ask for a lawyer's help. 
If you do that though, and there'll be some lawyers that'll be mad at me for saying this, as a dentist, what you want to do is be very clear with them what you care about. You wait, 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 you're telling me inside scoop from a, a lawyer? <laughs> scoop, right? <laughs> Tell them what you care about, give them the framework, be specific, define what you want. If you don't know, ask them and then tell them what you care about and even talk budget. This is what I'm anticipating spending. Can you help me get it done? Be really clear and do it that way. That's what I recommend. Because otherwise, okay. some of this, you know, James, some of these documents are 80 plus pages, single space, and it could take hours for a lawyer just to read every word. That happened to one of our deals. Remember, Warren, where we got the lawyers involved and all of a sudden we had a $5,000 lawyer bill on a, on a lease? Hey, yeah. wasn't that me? Wasn't that my Oh, pay? that was you. That's right. I should have negotiated before James, that. James, I want to overemphasize a point that you made, and that is that you can still go back and renegotiate. Right now, people that are watching this and they think, well, I've got my lease. I'm already done with this. I don't need to negotiate it. Well, that's not true. I, like you, have gone back and asked for a price reduction, and they gave it to me. So I had a 15-year lease, and I actually went in about year seven and talked to them, and we renegotiated it. So it's something that you should look at. Look at your lease that you have now, and that's it's something you can do. All they can, all they can do is all they can do is say no. All right, let's go to the next one. Negotiate your supplies, Warren. You're an expert at this. You've been doing this yeah. for so long. I haven't at all. Yeah. What's, what is this? I, I've done this uh, years and years ago. It was right after I got out of dentistry. I just noticed in the catalog prices every year it seemed like they were going up 10%. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I can't just keep paying 10% more every year. So that started me on a journey of always negotiating my su supply expense, you know, locking in prices, asking for free shipping, um, rebates. And right now for eAssist members, I'm negotiating with two of the largest supply companies in the United States, and we should have a deal done with one of the two, whoever gives us the best deal within probably two weeks. And we'll be passing that on to free to, to all our ESS members. But we're coming to ESS buying power. Yeah, it is big buying okay. power. All right, but negotiate your supplies. It's critically go do it. Do it. Do it. Do it, do it today. Do it tomorrow. Negotiate your lab fees. Here's the space here. Uh, Warren, you've done this successfully too. Please share your yeah. experience. Yeah. So anybody that calls their lab that they have a relationship, I would suggest you say, you know what? I really, I know there are less expensive labs. I really like what the work you guys do for me. I want to stay with you, but I just have to have some kind of price reduction to help out during these, you know, I, I wouldn't even mention going during forward. this time. Yeah. 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 I just, I, I, I just need a, a better price. Sometimes I've heard of people getting a lower price if they pay twice a month instead of once a month. Um, but yeah, you just ask them. And uh, one other thing that I negotiated when I negotiated with my lab, I said, I don't want to pay an analog expense for every time I do an implant crown. I'll just send those back to you and you break them out of the model and reuse them. They're like, okay, so that saves me $35 a, a lab, a lab bill. Um, you just have to think of those ways. If, if you're getting lab work out of state, ask them for free shipping or a reduction in shipping costs. Um, how about no extra fee if I rush a case? You know, will you do that for me? And uh, cosmetic upgrades as well. But this is another thing that we're going to, seek to do for our ESS members is negotiate with one lab per state and try to get uh, some buying power there as well. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Negotiate your marketing expenses. I'll do this one. So it's the, all different ideas, but, but you look at your marketing expenses and I negotiate with every single vendor you're buying marketing from. Now I think Google's a little harder to buy, negotiate on Google, but the, they do have sales reps and I have gotten special like $300 discounts every single month. Like they, they, they give those out with coupons and if you're doing coupons, you can probably get a lot more that's locked in. They do have people that like to reach out to you. So do a little research. If you do Google ads, even negotiate with those guys the best you possibly can. You might get $100 here and $100 there. Again, the $100 rule, every $100 adds up in time. Um, you can see some of the others there too. Negotiating with your PPO, PPOs, this is what's critically important. You should absolutely never sign a PPO contract without asking for an increase in prices. So every two years, instruct your front office. When those contracts show up, you want them on your desk and you want to call up people personally. You want to talk to the people that are there. You want them to know that you want to sign a new deal, but it's got to be a win-win. And right now it's a win-lose because my fees went up and your fees didn't. And, and, I, and I, my, expense, my supplies went up, costs went up, everything went up, and yours didn't. 
we were still doing class two uh, uh, posterior composites over here for $114 for one, for one insurance plan. It's the same fee we had in 2003. Yeah. Gee. When I found out about this a couple a, a couple years ago, I was like, I can't believe we haven't been doing this. And so, like, now we do, and you need to now, too. Uh, always, always ask for – Warren, you said something about – when you negotiate your PPO contract, and you can hire someone, but it doesn't work as well if, you do, if it's not the doctor on the line. They know what you're doing if you hire someone to do this. Yeah. They know you don't like to negotiate and you're afraid and you hired a professional and they're not going to give in, I believe, most of the time. They're not going to do it. If you do it yourself, they know the doctor really cares. The doctor's serious about leaving. And you might have, they might have 300 patients that, that uh, go to you and the more you know how many you got, you know, you're, you're, you're coming prepared as you map out the space and you just want to see to the table. You want to talk to someone that can make a decision, doctor to supervisor, and make sure you get an increase in fees in the most important things. And what are those, Warren? Well, yeah, it's the ones you do the most frequently. So I guarantee you the insurance company has already done an anal analyzed your fees and what you do the most frequently. And if you don't do any dentures, they'd be happy to give you $300 more a denture but, and give you nothing on a cleaning increase. They know what you. They know what it's going to cost them to give you an additional increase on the most frequently charged fees. So that's what you want to target. What do I charge the most? Every couple of few dollars is going to add up quickly. Great point. Okay, next, negotiating with your staff. Now I'm going to talk a little quieter, but <laughs> I treat my staff very, very well. I really, really do. Uh, I, I know there's no I in team. Isn't that what Coach Wooden said, Brian? Yeah, uh, me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's if you have, never mind. Yeah. Uh, so, but it's important you negotiate with your staff and that includes wages and, and paid time off and hours and weekends. Like I, when I started to open up our weekends, I wanted to open up extended hours on Saturdays and I couldn't get any staff that wanted to do it. And often some will hear over and over again, well, Saturdays aren't any good because no one wants to come. And then when they experiment with it, no one shows up. It's self-perpetuating because the person doesn't want to be there. They make sure that the doctor doesn't, doesn't, doesn't want to be there either because they, doesn't, they don't keep the schedule full. Uh, it, it happens over and over again. So what I learned is I negotiate with my staff. and I said, well, who will stay until 7 o'clock at night if I pay you an extra 50 cents an hour? And no one raised their hand. And I said, who will stay for a dollar? And on Saturdays, who will stay if I pay an extra dollar? No one raised their hand. When I got to $2 an hour from five o'clock on, I had almost half the staff raise their hand. So that's how I negotiated with my staff. It was a win-win. I realized, I realized I was gonna make the extra money back and I, I wanted to share, we wanted to be open and we have to do it as a team. I can't do it alone, I don't wanna do it alone. I wanna I want build everyone around me too. So keep that in mind, negotiate how they earn raises, and negotiate their attitude, what kind, of they, what kind of attitudes they gotta choose to have, stewardships and things, and we'll have another webinar about that in the future. Okay, negotiating, I think we've all tried to cut our cable once or twice, haven't we? Comcast out here in the West seems to have, it's just, they just raise their bill and raise their bill and raise their bill quietly. If you call them up and say, I want to I want to cancel, they transfer you over to some customer care line and they cut your bill in half for a year. <laughs> and then you got to call them up again. What a terrible business model. I'm not a happy customer. It's an oligopoly, right? Or natural monopoly. And so I like keep doing it, but I got to call them every year. We'll do now's your chance to negotiate. I even negotiated some city fees once. <laughs> you don't even think about that, but this is a true story. I have a little arcade too. I like Pac-Man and Missile Command and, and the founder of Atari is from, from, from uh, Utah. And so back in the day. So I have this little thing in one of our buildings and my kids all own it. And the city of Roy, Utah sent us a bill saying, hey, we charge $50 a machine on these coin-op machines, asteroids and Pac-Man, a year. And, and we have 45 of them in there. And so now we have a huge tax bill. We don't even make that kind of money in a month. I mean, this is a, just breaks even for the kids to go and have a job, right? And see a P&L and learn about business. It's just fun for our family. So I, in a family meeting, a little family board meeting, I, I said, now, who wants to fight this? And only one kid raised his hand, my little eight-year-old. And we marched over there to the city hall and we told him our story and my little son said it all. And he said it with a conviction and with, with his all heart, like this is my business. And they cut it down so they only tax us on six of the 45 machines. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is, and that was my approach and it was a win-win, they get all the tax they want and I'm happy with the tax now and it was a good, you can negotiate even your utilities, so do it. 
Next is negotiating with your software vendors. Uh, Warren or Brian, have you had any experience on this you'd like to talk about? Well, Brian, uh, I don't know if you do, no. but yeah, you know, oh. it, oh, sorry. No. I can say one, one is a Google review s s source that we use. And so we use BirdEye. And um, I told them, you know, what's your, what's your asking price? And they told me, and I said, well, what if I put it in multiple practices? What's the best deal you could do for me? They kept that bill in more than half by putting it into multiple practices. So it was down by 65%, right? Off of what they yeah. were going to charge you. So there's, those margins are so huge on software vendors, 90% profit margins. I still remember when, when Bill Gates was hauled in front of the, uh, the uh, House of Representatives and someone said, 90% profit margin, that's a great business you've built, isn't it? <laughs> like, yes, it is, sir. <laughs> I, I, in fact, I just, I just uh, you asked the question and I, I did just negotiate this just this last week. And uh, what I knew my zone, I knew where I was going to walk away and the price was beyond that. So I walked away, right? But interestingly enough, two days later, I got an email and that's part of the negotiation, right? You know where you're going to walk away. I walked away. It came back and he was now within my zone. Uh, so yep. part, of, part of negotiating. Go negotiate with all your software vendors. It's awfully important. Negotiate real estate and your practice loans. I just did this. I have a, a, a practice loan at 5.5% from 18 months ago. I just got it renegotiated to 3.0%. They're waiving the closing costs. They're waiving the appraisal fee. Appraisal fees. You can negotiate all these things. So there, here's some more. This is more, we try to map out the negotiation space for you in all these various twelve categories. And 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 more, Brian, you had the same experience, right? We won't go into details because of time, but you 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 were able to get yours negotiated down to like five years ago or eight years ago, yep. right? Yep. Yep. Okay, Warren, you do this very, very well. You negotiate yeah. your equipment purchases all the time. All the time because there's huge margins. And anytime you go to one of the suppliers and they tell you what the price for a piece of equipment is, I guarantee you there are huge margins. They can, they can cut it down much lower. And so you always want to do your research, know what a comparable product is, what the cheapest price online is. Um, and you throw that out and say, you know, if you were, if you were talking about this price, I could probably, you know, consider buying that and let them come back with what the, the lowest price they, they'll take after you throw out something you're almost embarrassed to offer for that piece of equipment. And then if once they do throw out a price, ask them again, is that the best price you can do? Um, I just did that uh, recently. I had to buy some equipment this week. Um, it was it was from a supplier. I believe it's on the next slide. And I negotiated with them. I don't have any stock in their company or anything. It's just someone that I use to, to buy uh, x-ray sensors for and x-ray equipment. And I thought about this webinar and I said, hey, by the way, uh, we have a webinar this Friday. Um, if you could give some special prices to our ESS viewers, if any, in case any of them are looking for some, some equipment, I'll go ahead and, and show your flyer on there. And and but we want some special deals, and so this is already kind of some of the specials they have during the COVID um, crisis to try to generate some income when nobody's buying. But if you email Robin at Video Dental and mention that ESS code, and you purchase, uh, if you email her today, is if you're interested, they will give you a few hundred dollars more off these prices. If in case anybody's interested in them, but I think the point you're proving, the point you're proving, Warren, is that you can just ask for an extra hundred dollars here and there, and those hundred dollar things add up, and when right. then you wake up and your profit and your overhead's thirty eight percent. Yeah. So it's important. That's the point we're trying to drive home here, and we appreciate equipment purchasers. We're not in any way saying they're the bad guys. This is not a win lose. We want a win win for everybody, and we just want to understand that you can. Don't be afraid. You need to. And it's important and, and, and it'll be a win-win. Negotiate with patients by raising your fees every year. This is one that we kind of, it's a little play on negotiation. But it's important, it's incredibly important that you raise your fees every single year. In economics, they call it a nuisance raise. People will pay an extra 5% raise on, on items usually without any issues. I remember back when, I, uh, when, the, when the Whopper hamburger was 99 cents. I got one a couple days ago, it was like six bucks. So those nuisance, nuisance uh, fees increases like add up over time. 20 years ago, it was 99 cents. <laughs> you just have to keep up with inflation, that's for sure. And with all the bailout stuff, it's, inflation is going to hit real hard. So now's the time. If you haven't had the habit of been doing this, you got to start raising your fees every single year. Warren, you, uh, I know Harvard does this. Their tuitions get raised every year by 5% routinely, yeah. over, over and over again. Every year, 5%. You have a strategy, Warren? 
Yeah, I, I do. Absolutely. Minimally 5% every year. Um, it's easiest. It's the other easiest way to put new money in your pocket, you know, without working harder is raise your fees. And we never see turnover like, oh, your fees are too high now. Loss of a lot of patients. Patients always keep coming. We don't see loss of patients from raising our fees. And if everybody in the United States would take this approach as a profession together and continue to do this, then we would get paid better from insurance companies as well. Absolutely. If we were as a team, now, I guess there's some rules that we can't all tell each other what we do. I don't, I think you can find out on some websites. I'm not sure who lobbied for that rule. Maybe it was the insurance companies. But we, we uh, if we all were to like, create a big union and band together, oh, that's what, if we were to do something together and say, this is our fees, I guess that's illegal. <laughs> Taylor, is that maybe illegal? Maybe look at him. He's starting to sweat. Taylor, maybe, is that illegal? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe we should move on to the next slide. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> we won't do that. But the point nice is, fixing, huh? <laughs> the, the point is you should raise your fees every single year. And if we were all doing this independently of one another, so there's nothing illegal about it, then the PPOs would raise their fees too. As long as you're submitting your fees to the PPO on your claims, even though they adjust off you know, your fees versus the contracted fees, you got to make sure you're doing that so you raise up all the boats every year. Now, this is important too. But Warren, you actually give your office manager a one-time bonus every year, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, to make sure she increases all the fees, right? Because there's some yeah. work. She has to update everything. There's, there's some extra work for her, you know, and it, it's – entering all those new fees, the new fee schedule into the computer. So I usually do give her actually a few hundred dollars um, to do this once a year because that's I'm going to make that back in seconds once she has that completed. Tell me about this one, negotiating with yourself, partners, and associates. Yeah, so this is also important. When you are making partnerships, you want to make sure it is a win-win. So like when I have somebody that's looking to buy in uh, to my, one of my practices, I want to make sure that it feels great to them because if they feel great about the deal and they're going to be invested, they're going to treat it and it relieves headaches from me because now that's their baby. They're going to take care of it. So be willing to sacrifice a little bit of income for the long-term gain of knowing that that person's basically part of your retirement. They're generating money for you there in that practice when you're not there. Or if you have an associate, remember they're generating money for you. Don't get, um, you know, I hear bad stories once in a while. That's my crown. That's your crown. That's, you know, my patient. That's your so patient. Bad. You can't let those things eat away at you. Remember, it's the long-term game. Yeah, you're, you're a team. You got to live the law of abundance. You can't be selfish. That's how partnerships work. It's like, hey, yeah, give and take. We're all here. We're going to help each other out together. And here you go. So these are the 12 areas where you can negotiate. It's important you do. And I hope you've learned something here. This is number one of the big, of the big whatever. Let's, Brian, we got another poll here. Is that what you want to do? Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, how, many, how many of these items will you now – oh, thanks. You just turned it right on for me. How many of these items will you now try to negotiate? Uh, select all that apply. So this is the list we've just gone over. I'd like to know if we've influenced you in any way. Multiple uh, choice. Select as many as you need. Select, select as many as you want. <laughs> Hopefully you select Oh, they're them. coming in now. They're coming in strong. <laughs> Holy cow. All right. Looks like, oh, the big winners are. Oh, we everyone. got a lot. Just, it's just moving. People are, people are interested in negotiating. That's great. That's important. This is big. They all started as Dr. Borg's and now they're going to be Dr. Willis's. That's right. <laughs> Wait a minute. When we started yeah. this, 70% yeah. didn't want to negotiate at all when we started this. And now we got, we only had 70 people voting. We have 140 voted so far right now, and it's still coming in. And now everyone wants to do everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. accomplished. As long it's as like, they negotiate collectively. Yep, yeah, collectively as the board. Yeah, that's right. All right, let's, let's close it down and move on. We have about 46% that have, have done that. There you go. You can see it's all across the board. Now, take solace from your peers. Mm -hmm. These are real dentists. I have to end like in two minutes because I got a patient that's supposed to come in. <laughs> so, like, we're, my point is we're real dentists, guys. We're real dentists. We're here with you. We get it. And now all of us who were at 70% were afraid. And now look, we're all going to negotiate all these things. And the biggest is supplies. And then, then lab fees. And then leases and utilities and everything all around. Love it. That's how you mind your margins. This is foundational. This is why we wanted to talk about this first. It's incredible. Remember the $100 rule. Every 100 bucks you save will add up in time real fast. That's how Walmart built their empire. It was like yep. the $10 rule or the, the, <laughs> or the 60 cent rule. Dollar rule. The dollar rule. Okay. Remember, I said this before. My dad always said, don't be afraid to ask. All they can say is no. 
that's not scientific, but that'll help you with emotions and the epi on top of everything else. So remember this. This is what we've, we we invite you to do these things today. Please do this. If you don't, if you just sit, if you do, if you don't do these actionable items, you will not get out of this what we hope you get, and that is a much more profitable practice and peace of mind. That's what we're trying to deliver here. So know for certain what percentages of your overhead, you know, what, what it is for each of these eight categories. And then aim for a 49% total for all of it. You gotta know what it is now, and so you know where you gotta get, and then you can start to drill in on all these various areas until you get 49%. Understand what your, your uh, practice hourly overhead rate is. That number is critical, recalculate it every month, put it on your scoreboard, make your team see it. It'll help with everything. Negotiate everything. Make a plan to negotiate all 12 of these over the next month, if not sooner. Like now's your time to negotiate that, and then join us for part two and part three of this webinar, webinar series. And if, if this was a longer webinar than what we thought, it's an extra half hour. Uh, so we might have to make this four parts or five parts. We're just gonna share all we can in a way that you can understand as we keep developing these webinars to help you mine your margins. Right now, our next, our next webinar is next month, June 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Mountain. Um, all right, Sarah, let's open up some questions. We still have 300 people on. Let's answer any questions we have before we finish. All right, we do have um, a few questions that have come in specifically about how you broke out the dentist income. Um, if you have an associate doctor who is on payroll, who's not a partner or an owner, but an associate doctor on payroll, do you list them in the staff wages or do you list them in dentist income and why? I list them in dental income because at the end of the day when the practice is evaluated, they're gonna look at what is all the income generated to a dentist. That's, that's the potential money that can be made by someone purchasing this practice. So like we said, maybe an associate, it, I might have an associate in there three days a week. I did earlier in this very practice that I'm in right now. The associate was there three days a week. I was there one day a week as an owner. If someone was going to purchase this practice, they were going to say, oh, I could work all four days and I could make that total income. So that's why I do it that way. Got it. Because I think there were a few questions trying to understand the difference. And so you're thinking through how you present this information or how you present the dentist income, how a, a true venture capital firm may come in and actually yep. assess it, right? Not necessarily exactly. an expense, but what your practice would really be worth if it were a business being assessed. Well, well, the venture capital firm is going to look at it all as, and they're going to look at EBITDA is what the venture capital firm is going to look yeah. at. Yeah. They're going to look at it's, it's the other dentists that you know use Kasani. Who are the guys in Oregon? Kasani and Sons. Kasani and Associates. If you, if you go to a broker and a dentist is going to buy another practice from a dentist, this is how they evaluate it because they're going to assume that you're going to work six days a week. If they have, if you have one associate and the other guy's full time too, and they're working sixty hours a week, you could go work all those sixty hours as a dentist, and so that's how much this practice is really worth. And so it's important you break it out. So when Dennis talk about overhead, that's what they're talking about. That's why it's different than a typical business. and Maybe why it's been evaluated a different way. So we're asking you to do the both of that. You know, do, understand, think like a dentist, but also if you do decide to sell, think like a, a real bank, an investment bank. When you go to evaluate the price of your practice, well, it's not. Your overhead is, uh, it's, it's, what, it's, it's eight times your EBITDA at the end of the day. And that's, uh, that's a fair evaluation. But when you look at mining your margins and looking at what your overhead is. Oh, got some Wi-Fi problems, Dr. Anderson there. <laughs> Maybe somebody it's else jumped on his Wi-Fi. It's a question Wi -Fi. though, Sarah. I had the same question, uh, but, it, but it, I, I believe that Warren's way of calculating that is, is the most accurate way. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you pay your dentist? Is it out of net production? So I pay my, all of my partners get paid what the collectible production is. So that's, that's the production minus write-offs and minus adjustments. So after, after we know what that is, after any discounts, that is what I pay them a percentage on. And I use, I use 30% in my practices. We pay, pay 30% of the collectible production, what we can really collect. And do you set any kind of budget for dentist income? Um, I don't set a budget per se, like if I'm hiring an associate and how much that, that should cost me. Nope. I don't, I don't have a yeah. budget. For yeah, you wouldn't need to because it's all based on uh, percentage anyways, right? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how many of the, the guys on the panel here actually negotiate yourselves or do you have staff that negotiate for you? <laughs> I do all my negotiations. Me too. 
Good question. I, I negotiate all, all mine as well. I would consider it for a, a very big thing, maybe for like a lease or something. I may, I may get some advice, but I do think that the doctor negotiating it is, is the best way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So when it comes to negotiating with insurances, how many of you have had success doing that? I've had success. I've done it several times. And like James said, it's better if the doctor's involved. You don't just hand that off to your office manager. Be involved in it. Talk to them yourself. Tell them, you know, hey, you know, I need to talk to somebody else that's in charge. You know, you don't go as high up as you can with that company when you're talking about insurance and, and tell them why you need more. You know, a different perspective from that. I, I have had uh, success with it as well. And it's so much so that when they've argued with me and said, no, I'm not going to do it. There's been times where I'm like, well, I'm not going to give up that insurance. I'll go play a game. They're not going to do it. I'll, I'll, I'll move along. But there's been some that I, that's been outside my zone. And I says, well, never mind. I, I'm going to cut you, cut you loose. Every single time that I've done that, that I've cut them loose and said, well, I'm not going to be on your list anymore. It's not enough. Every time they have called me back within a week and come back and play ball with me. So it, it's just speaking from experience. Don't See, be afraid to walk away from it and negotiate. To make, to make everybody feel better, I have never had experience doing it. As a matter of fact, I hired someone to do it for me, and it didn't work very well. And so I was like, I don't know if you can. And then I heard from Warren like five years ago what you did. And I was like, what is going on? And I never made time. I never went and I cared for the 100 bucks because I didn't really like to negotiate it. I was like, wait, am I really going to be successful at it? It's a lot of time. Understanding these concepts and these principles are fundamental to you getting the margins, the overhead down to 38, 49%. It's fundamental. And, and when, you, when you actually hear success stories and failures like mine when it comes to negotiating, like, like this is real. So don't feel bad if you're in my category. If you're in Brian's and Warren's, okay, high five. Let's all be in Brian and Brian's and Warren's next week. <laughs> but, the, but once you sign your PPO contract, you can't negotiate for the next two years or three years or whenever it expires. Like you are locked in. So it's that at that moment when it's time to renew, like you tell your staff, hey, 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 we negotiate all this stuff. You put them on my desk. You give me the phone number of the supervisor. You do all the homework for me. Uh, and I'm going to make those phone calls. And you tell me what, what prices I should be, you know, I, I'm going to negotiate for and raise them up for. But you can do that collectively as a team. But, okay, great question. Um, another question we had come in a couple of times is regarding the fact that right now PPE costs are skyrocketing um, for doctors and insurance companies, if they're reimbursing anything at all for that additional cost is borderline laughable. Um, so what we've got here is a lot of people wondering how they mine their margins and continue, you know, making their practice profitable with cost, costs like that skyrocketing. Any suggestions for them? Well, I, I think as a profession, we all have to keep billing it out. We all have to keep billing that miscellaneous code and saying, you know, increase PPE costs. Um, and just keep doing it as a profession, because if we all do it, it's going to set a standard. You can't give up. We just keep keep at it, keep billing insurances, uh, whether they pay or not. And, um, you know, maybe they'll come together and say, okay, we are going to allow for a, just a general increase of fees this at this time, because we understand there is an increase in cost in every procedure. I've heard that rumbling that that's going to happen, but... Uh, until then, let's keep at, let's keep asking for it. The other, the other part to that, Warren, if we remember, we, we're bargaining the collective here. Uh, sometimes we have to go and, and mind our margins in another way. So maybe we get beat up on PPE, but we can go to our lease people and negotiate, okay, for this time being, while wow, this is a reason why I need to lower my price. I've, I'm paying more for PPE. Or you go to other places and negotiate the collective, right? to try to mind your margins uh, where, you're, where you're losing in other ways. This is coming from Dr. Borg. So. That's right. <laughs> Resistance is futile. Who I think said he would avoid negotiating like the plague. <laughs> That's right. He likes it. Oh, no, I he's, it. <laughs> he's getting better. He's, he's been doing it all week. He's been trying. Uh, yeah, that's true. Let's, let's, that's take right. one more, let's take one more question. We have people dropping off right now, and I got to get to a patient. Let's go one more. Pick the best one you got out there, Sarah. Okay. All right. Well, we've got, Ooh, that's a lot of pressure. We got a lot of questions left here. I think one I'll, I'll pick here is from Craig in the chat. He was asking specifically about collective negotiation. How do you practice that art of collective negotiation um, and with multiple parts without addressing specific details? You still address specific details, but what you say is I'm not going to agree to this detail. We're not going to sit here. We're not, like, like, like what you ask, you ask what, what everybody wants from all the various details. 
And then you start to, once you know what people want from the various things, you start to say, hey, I want this, and you, but you, I'll, I'll give on this, and then I want over here, and I'll give on that, but I need over here. That way you can negotiate a collective package, a coll one deal with a bunch of variables in it, rather than, rather than line by line by line by line by line. It starts by talking about them all and listing them all out, what everybody wants. And then you hope you've done your homework on their Zopa or where they're, you know, their BATNA for each of those, where are they gonna, when are they going to walk away, and you get it all the way down to their very bottom. That's the real art. And it takes time and it takes work, but in time, you begin yeah. to enjoy it. Usually when I do a lease negotiation now, I just go ahead and tell them the terms that I want on every item that I know they won't agree to, but they're, they're a little outreached on every single item. Right you're, anchoring them. you're anchoring them all the way through. Yeah. That's yeah. what you're doing. All right. Well, if you have any other questions, you can eat. go ahead, Taylor. I was going to say, yeah, map it out. And nothing wrong with saying, let's table that. Let's table that. And, and you know, each of these items, I just did it this morning on an agreement. And, and so, and then you come back to it. What, cause you already know what, what you're, uh, what you're willing to do. Taylor makes fun of me because I like to just get it done as an entrepreneur. And I, I, it's hard. You have to be patient. If you're going to negotiate, you have to be willing to walk away and come back next week. And it's not very efficient. But it's kind of, it's just part of the art of the deal, I guess. <laughs> I know James lasts for about 45 minutes and then we have to end the call. And yeah, like again. whatever, <laughs> let's just go. I want to sign. Where's the dotted line? I remember yeah, Taylor, our dad always said, what does it all mean? Where, where's my draw? Where do I sign? Like that's, that's the right. That's right. So you can't do it that way. All right. Well, thanks everybody. If you have any more questions, you can email them. What's the email address? They can email the panel and we'll, we'll try to get back to you in the next few, you know, few days. Yep. You what can email webinar at eassist.me. And again, we'll make sure that a recording of this is shared with you as well as the slides here. And we'll also include these sample P&Ls that we provided as well. You'll get all of that information. We'll shoot it all over to you in an email. Now guys, we're, we're helping you and we hope you, you, hope, we hope you help, help other dentists too. So share what you have, share the webinar, share the links. Let's help dentists help dentists. Let's deliver peace of mind together. Thanks everybody, I appreciate it. Until next time, have fun. Have fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. See you later. Thanks, everybody.